all of the programs that, that constitute these multiple processes. So there's a lot of complexity that lies there. Uh, the second thing is uh, cohesive techniques. Uh, over the course of my life, I have been trying my best to collect uh, a collection of techniques that work. C++ is a vast language and not all of it necessarily always fits together and so there is some uh, uh, subset of use that has worked out really well for us and if you look at uh, a number of different aspects of that subset of use they fit together nicely. It's not the only possible way but it's what we do and it works and that's a good thing. And then I'd like to briefly demonstrate some of the things that we do uh, uh, on some, uh, some real code. Obviously this is a very high level talk so I have gone out of my way not to pick low level fights. I have been encouraged by all of the people around me not to pick low level fights which means I've tried to avoid showing you any detail that you might disagree with. This is all high level. Could apply to any language almost. Yes sir? Is that a challenge? <laughs> I will take that challenge, but I ask only that I get through the talk first. Then we can wrestle. All right. And you'll probably win, no question about it. I'm not, the, I'm not in as good shape as I was about six years ago. Uh, six years ago, it would have been a bit better. All right, now, uh, we're going to start with this. Uh, my schedule is probably going to be 15 minutes on the first, 15 minutes on the second, 30 minutes on the third, 15 minutes on the fourth, and 15 minutes on the fifth. If I'm behind that schedule, please don't heckle me. If by some miracle I am, I might be able to take one question. So we'll start with this. What are the goals? So what are we trying to do? So I put these up for you guys to ponder what we're trying to do. What are we trying to do? Uh, I can't speak these words because they don't, they don't roll off my tongue, but just take a look and see if any of those seem familiar to you. Okay, that's enough. Let's say, uh, who, are, who are our intended clients? And when I say who are our intended clients, I really don't mean necessarily everybody in the room. Maybe there's some subset of you that happen to share the, uh, the similar kinds of clients that I'm looking to, to address, um, but I just wanted to put these up there as examples of what might be intended clients. Okay, enough of that. So, our intended clients. Uh, professional commercial software engineers and application developers. So that's good. Solving real world industrial strength problems, working on a series of projects of arbitrary size, using a variety of well-known popular platforms, committed to aggressive schedules, held to a high standard of quality and reliability, constrained by limited resources, and driven to succeed. So if you're not in this category, we might not be addressing your needs. And unfortunately, C++, C++ does try to address a lot of needs. We're not trying to address all of them. We're trying to address a subset. And this is an indication of the kind of person we might be pleasing. Um, so our primary goal, um, we want to make our, our intended clients uh, successful, productive, and efficient. Um, we want to demonstrate uh, a good methodology, something that they can use. Uh, we want to provide a framework that allows them to get started. In other words, some core foundation from which we can all grow. So that's, that's important as well. Um, we want to uh, address the problems of our clients. Uh, we want to provide stable solutions. So we want, we, we, we want to make something that people can use as a commercial basis uh, for their software. Uh, we want to teach people a good way of writing software, not the only way, but a good way. Uh, and most importantly for us, uh, we want to achieve this widespread fine-grained hierarchical reuse. So that's, that's what we're trying to achieve by doing things the way we do it. The hierarchical part is key here. All right, so achieving reuse. So um, this, this is what I'd like to say is brittle software. Uh, without explaining it, everybody will have their own intuition as to what brittle software is. This is itself a talk, but we're making it simple. Brittle software can be used in one place at one time. And that's sort of another definition of what brittle software is. Try to reuse it out of its original context. Uh, it's, it's, it's unlikely that it's going to be productive. Then we have this thing called collaborative software. Collaborative software is aware of its surroundings, doesn't necessarily have physical dependencies, but uh, uh, it has a, a little bit more regularity. And we might be able to use collaborative software across many versions of a particular application or product. Then we have this nice reusable software. And this may or may not seem pleasing to you, but each of these reusable pieces is easy to explain and understand 
and use in multiple applications. And then we get this higher level reusable thing called a circle. And we're going to call this reusable software. So everybody, again, has their own intuition. Uh, that will work for me. And this reusable software can be used across many versions of many applications. So far, so good? OK. What we don't want to do, and, and some people talk about malleable software, malleable software being software that we can easily change to adapt to any of our needs. Oh, that's application software, and that's fine. But that is certainly not reusable software. And um, this is just to make that point. So fundamental properties of modular software. Uh, that this, we're going to talk about this now. Fine-grained physical modularity. In other words, we can't have big pieces. Because if you're using big pieces, uh, you're going to be dragging in a lot of stuff that you don't actually need. Um, logical and physical coherence. This is another thing. If we have something that we need logically, we're also going to need to be able to point to it physically. We will talk about this more. Uh, I'm sure everybody realizes that, that, that static cyclic physical dependencies are a bad thing. We don't have to even argue that, I hope. We're well past that. That was pretty much agreed upon, I hope, many years ago. If not, then we have definitely a bone to pick. Um, this is one that's less well known. No private backdoor access. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, here's an example of fine or coarse grain modularity. You just look at it and say, gee, that's coarse grain. Here's fine grain modularity. Again, this is a high level talk. Whatever it means to you, that's good enough for right now. Okay, then we've got this notion of, uh, of logical and physical. By the way, the circular things are logical and the square things are physical because that's what the cartoons look like in this talk. So here we have a bunch of files and in this case, uh, this is where I use the multitude of slides so I don't need to describe where what I'm asking you to look at, you can see from the screen that I'm asking you to look at these uh, stack.h and stack.cpp and we have something there push and pop and uh, we don't have the definitions corresponding to the declarations. We have decided to place in inset, we've decided to place stack.push's definition and then over in main we've decided to place stack.pop's definition. I'm sure everybody in the room sees that this is just a plain old bad idea, right? We don't do this because it's silly. Okay, so we don't have cyclic dependencies. You can see here that each one of these uh, components in its .cpp file includes the other two uh, uh, components. And so we can't really deal with any one of these without dealing with all three. Again, that's just a given, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Here's an example of backdoor access where we have something in another uh, physical unit that has private access to our, to our uh, uh, insides. For example, we have a linked list and we have a cursor. And if the cursor exists in another translation unit and then we decide we want to make the linked list have an endpointer, for example, we, we check out the linked list, we give it the endpointer, we put it back, and as soon as the cursor tries to do something, we're in trouble. So this is no good. We can fix it by putting it in the same component, then we don't have as big a problem. The cursor would also be thought of as an iterator. All right, so conventional reuse. Um, only the architectural significant pieces are exposed. So here's a picture of something where we have the standard library, we have some mid-level piece, and then some big uh, uh, chunk, architectural chunk that we can use. And it's hard to say that we're reusing the logger, we're just using it. Um, as far as the standard library, of course we're going to use that. Um, but that's about it. There's nothing underneath the standard library to reuse because it's not specified. And every vendor is going to specify their own stuff for their own purposes, but it, it can't be shared. What we'd like to see is that at every level that the pieces, the sub-pieces, the sub-sub-pieces are specified, are stable, and are available for reuse. So this is an important aspect of the hierarchical nature of the reuse. So these pieces here in particular are there, they're defined, they're documented, they're stable. So, in a nutshell, if we had this in an ideal world, we would have our library software broken out into all different levels of, of, of abstraction, all the way down to stuff that's below the standard library. Hard to believe, the standard library is the starting point, right? The standard library is built out of stuff that's so far down you wouldn't believe. It's built out of, of, of like quarks and, 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 and atoms and molecules, and it goes all the way up. In fact, it turns out that the, the, the lowest level unit, we'll talk about what that unit is, that, that we have, the top level of it is an overlay of the standard library, the top level of this lowest level thing. So just for food for thought. 
All right. So, as library developers, we must, these are things I, I'm suggesting we must do, draw complexity inward, push simplicity outward, provide correct, complete, yet concise function level contracts. See what I was talking about at lunch? You know, I'm like big into contracts. Um, avoid gratuitous variation in rendering. I don't know how many people care about this. I bet you if I showed you my rendering, you'd all argue that, oh, that's wrong. You'd all have a different reason for why it's wrong. You'd all argue with yourselves too. Maybe not. Maybe there'd be a couple because of the birthday problem that might get along. But basically, the variation in rendering is a huge impediment to our hierarchical reads. And I want to argue that it shouldn't, the variation, the rendering shouldn't vary gratuitously. Um, and I'd like to achieve a reliability at least as good as our compilers. Now, depending on who you talk to in my group, this is not actually high enough that this is this is not a, this is not a high enough bar that it's at least as good it should be much better than any one of our compilers but anyway you get the idea uh, all right so what are we trying to do we're trying to make our software these are these are things that I've been thinking about and saying for a very long time what do they mean so here's easy to understand again canonical rendering don't make things more difficult than they need to be good documentation and usage examples we'll come back to that much later um, Easy to use, okay? So we need a usage model. Uh, we need to be able to, once, once we understand it, it shouldn't be a pain in the butt to use. It should be intuitive. Um, there should be an appropriate level of safety. If it's too safe, it might be hard to use. If it's not safe enough, it might be hard to use. And of course, if it depends on the world, it's not easy to use. Um, high performance. Now, performance goes a number of different ways. Um, if you say, well, I want it to scale to arbitrarily large size but it also has to scale to arbitrarily small size and many instances of it. So that's another kind of scaling. Uh, it has to be reasonable compile time, reasonable link time, and when you get it on disk, it has to be a reasonable size. So these are all things that sort of fall into that portable, hey, I want it to be able to work on all the platforms I'm interested in. I think this pretty much speaks for itself. Um, and five, I want it to be reliable. I wish I had time to talk about what we do to make things reliable. That is its own multiple set of talks. It's something that we do very well. Uh, I'm asking you to trust me. We'll talk about it just a little bit towards the end of the talk. But we want to achieve no core dumps, no memory leaks, uh, no incorrect results, no bugs, and no, we're not kidding. Okay? How good does it have to be? So uh, an application, I argued a long time ago, it's kind of like building a building. Uh, it must adequately perform its functions. Some of us get very ambitious, and so we'll create an application. You know, you want to live in it, you want to be comfortable. Um, and it must be safe under normal conditions. Okay, so we'll build a really sturdy edifice that you know, will withstand pretty much anything. Out of brick, it's all good. But then once we've got that going, there are certain uh, trade-offs that have to be made. So you might go with something like this. Maybe I could sell you this thing. Sometimes we don't have time to test it or even figure out how to assemble it. And then it kind of gets old. Okay. So anyway, writing readers in libraries are different. I'm arguing it's a different beast, and I think everybody on the standards committee or knows about it, we spend an awfully long time trying to get it right the first time, and that's a wonderful thing. Now, I've got this book that I've been working on. It was due in uh, September 2001. I'm a bit late, uh, but in any case, the goal of reusable software is, is to be used wherever appropriate, and human beings, not computers, will make that determination. So the thing is, it's not good enough for this to be the right answer. I have to convince some irrational being that it's the right answer. And so I got this other person who'll back me up on this. And he said, we conjecture that the barriers to reuse are not on the producer's side, but on the consumer's side. If a software engineer, a potential a consumer of standardized components, perceives it to be more expensive to find a component that meets his needs and so verify than to write one anew, a new duplicative component will be written. Notice that we said perceives above. It does not matter what the true cost of reconstruction is. So this was in Brooks 95 book. So it must be true. And, and the guy's a smart guy. I, you know, it, this is just the way it is. So reusable li library software has to appear to be way better than anybody else could do on their own real quick. That just has to be the case. And it's not like a house. It's, it's something that can be used by many people, many kinds of people at the same time. So that's a good thing. Uh, the more clients, the greater the utility, right? The more people are using it. And by the same token, the greater the utility, the more people who want to use it. There's that nice little uh, uh, synergy going on there. 
And in fact, a little plug for Bloomberg, whenever a client wants to use the Bloomberg application, uh, what do they do? They put in a request, we build it, and we give it to everybody who owns the Bloomberg. So it's another quadratic kind of thing where the more people, the more functionality, the more functionality, the more people want to use it, and so on. All right, so here's an example where we didn't get any reconvergence in our dependency graph. And I just put this up there. This is where we've done top-down design and then bottom-up implementation uh, and testing, whatever, this kind of thing. But we really don't care what else is going on. There's no reuse going on here at all. Now, if you see something like this, you say, wow, that's a lot better. There aren't an exponential number of leaves. Now, clearly, we try for something like this don't always succeed. But if we could get something like this, where there's some sort of bound at each level of abstraction, we write all the software we need at that level, and then we're good, it's surprising in practice how much this actually can happen. We actually know, because we look at the software, we have bazillions of examples where we can see this kind of thing either happen or not. All right, so how good does the reusable library software need to be? This is where it gets to be a hard sell. Uh, it needs to be really, really, really good. And by really good, I mean, imagine that we were trying to design the, the, the graving plates for the $100 bill. Uh, how much do we want to spend on that, given that it's going to be used by who knows how many Americans and then people overseas? We're probably more worried about them. So we've got to make this thing pretty, pretty good, because if we're not successful here, what happens to the United States economy? So this is one of those things. Nothing succeeds like excess. If it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. OK, if we succeed, we have this nice, stable block of, of library software that's hierarchically reusable by all of these applications. If we fail, we have this, which is not good. I think intuitively everybody sees that. Okay. The nice thing about this is we have all these applications using this lump of reusable software. And that can be amortized over all of the different applications, over all of the versions. So we at least have that to explain the perceived cost of developing this software. It is a perceived cost, because you are going to develop it anyway. You're going to maintain it anyway. It's going to be there. It's just that instead of thinking ahead, you're playing catch up. It's like a high interest loan. What do you want to do? OK, so hierarchical reusable software, that is the goal. It's also known as software capital. OK, two minutes behind schedule. Process and architecture. So almost every talk that I give, I have to talk about process and architecture, uh, organizing software's components, physical design and such. Physical design is an organizing principle. It's something that, that we think about very early on in the process. And sound physical design, uh, without that, you know, we, couldn't, we couldn't do anything. So if we start out with you know, good intentions, we start out with applications and libraries, pretty much everybody, I think, when they start out, they have any sense. They'll separate their code into library software and application software. And then another application can come along and use it. And then maybe we'll have another library that it'll depend on it, and the application will use it. Notice that the dependency is downward. High-level things depend on low-level things. Applications are up here. Libraries are down here. And then somebody will come along and depend on another application. Anybody who's shuddering now, that's the time to start worrying. Okay, then we have a library software uh, depending on another library. That's fine. But then an application, now this thing is pointing up. How bad is that? Is that bad? It's not that bad yet. Well, it's pointing up. Well, but there isn't a cycle yet. Okay, now there's a cycle. Uh, and then, you know, pretty soon, People stopped caring about this stuff. People start putting software wherever they feel like. And then not too long after that, things get tied in a knot. Once this happens, it's really bad. And uh, you know we don't want this to happen, right? Of course, we can't do much about it. We try, and we try, and then uh, you know it gets like this. And then, uh, OK, I want to thank you all for coming. <laughs> Any questions? No, all right, well, we're going to go on. So we need to do something to organize ourselves so that that doesn't happen. And again, the regular fine green physical packaging, a uniform depth of physical aggregation, and logical physical synergy. So these are the points. So we're going to start, we'll try to get through these three things in the next 10 minutes. We'll see if we're lucky. Um, what distinguishes logical from physical design? Logical classes and functions and templates and all those good syntactic things that we sweat over. And the physical has to do with files and libraries and physical linkage. Is the linker involved? Is the compiler involved? What's going on there? And that stuff is, is genuinely hard. And if you want to try organizing things, you really need to understand your tool set. Um, 
these components, which we'll talk about here, uh, are, are things that aggregate logical content. So um, here's a component. Now what is a component? <clears throat> Every component has a CPP file. Every component has a header file. Every component, we hope, has a standalone test driver. So this is what we're trying to do. This is the way we aim to build our software. There are huge benefits to doing things this way. Do you have to do things this way? Of course not. You don't need header files in C++. You don't need them. They're not required. They're optional. We still use them. We use them to good advantage, but we don't need to. Anyway, this is our fundamental unit of design. Okay. So here we go. The CPP file includes its .h file as the first substantive line of code. That is a requirement of a good component. If, it's, if this isn't the case, the component is not, is not legit. It's not a property. And by the way, as I said, every .cpp file, uh, uh, even if it's otherwise empty, we still include the .h in the CPP. Okay, there are lots of reasons for doing this. One of the best reasons is if you have um, anything that can be detected syntactically, you detect it in the component. Uh, obviously, you want to make sure that anything de that's declared in the header is consistent with what's defined in the component and that it can compile. And if you happen to make it the first substantive line of code, you avoid any include order dependencies. So that is important. The second one is all logical constructs effectively have external physical linkage uh, that that effect that uh, that. Sorry, all logical constructs effectively having external physical linkage in a .cpp file are declared in the .h. What this does is it allows you to know at a source code level what is popping out from your uh, 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 ABI interface. So this is one rule that we have. Um, and, and again, by, by physical linkage, what I'm talking about is the linker getting involved or, or is the compiler getting involved. So uh, internal physical linkage, compiler, external physical linkage, linker. Um, the third one, which is the example we saw, uh, all constru constructs having external physical linkage that are declared in the header file, if they're defined at all, they're de defined in this component. So we don't get that incredible lack of modularity. Uh, and then the fourth one is, if I'm using functionality in another component, then I'm going to pound include its header file, which will have its declarations. I won't try to declare them myself. And that's especially true for functions, and, and, and variables with, with static storage duration because my translation unit may never see those definitions, in which case they cannot line up. There's nothing in the standard that says that the compiler has to let you know that that's the case. All right, so I really cut this to the bone. Here we have a bunch of components. Use your intuition. Let's say a polygon is a shape. Let's say a polygon uses point in its interface. And let's say I've got an implementation of polygon that's pointless. Here is some notation. I'm just going to say there's some notation there. And from this notation alone, we are able to deduce the physical dependencies across the components. So this is the depends on relation, and those are the physical dependencies. Once we know the physical dependencies, the specific logical relationships go away, or they can, because we can derive everything we need from the physical dependencies. And the way we do that is we assign level numbers, and we say, OK, things that don't depend on other things uh, are at level one. Things that depend on only those things at level one are at level two. Things that are uh, uh, that depend on things at level two and level one, well, they're at level three. Now, if you notice on the bottom, there's that funny dotted line. That is an in-name only dependency. And what that means is that while shape names point by a forward declaration, i.e. class point, it doesn't pound include point, and that's okay. Um, this is a collaborative thing rather than a physical dependency. We can talk about that more later. I just wanted to show you the picture because it's good to know. Now, this term levelize. We're going to go into some detail. This is a word that I created in my 1996 book, levelize. We need to levelize that design. I, we need to make its physical dependency graph acyclic, levelizable. Uh, are you sure that design is levelizable, i.e., do you know how to make its physical dependencies acyclic? Levelization. What levelization techniques would you use, i.e., what techniques would you use to levelize your design? Uh, now, this is my shameless advertisement, so I'm putting shameless advertisement. You can actually get a book, 1996, Lakos, large scale, whatever, and you can read about these different techniques to avoid cyclic dependencies in design. Okay, so essential design rules, there are two. What are the two design rules? The first one is no cycles. The second one is no long distance friendship. That means if I have friendship, it's within a physical unit i.e., if I have a unit of logical encapsulation, it itself is encapsulated in a unit of physical encapsulation. So there, therein lies the coherence. 
I don't have my, my uh, logical endings distributed all across all of my physical boundaries. Okay, so criteria for co-locating public classes. When do I have more than one class in a component? Some people would argue we should put a lot of classes in one component. Some people would say one class per component. We're somewhere in the middle. If there's friendship involved, the number one reason that we have more than one class in a component is friendship. The prime example of that is an iterator. That's the open close principle without inheritance, right? I have my iterators so that I don't need to go in and add another method to my class. Then I have cyclic dependencies. That doesn't happen much. We hate cyclic dependencies, even within components. The third one is a single solution, and an example of that would be variadic templates or something where we've said we've got a lot of different pieces. They don't depend on each other. No one of them solves any problem. Together they solve a problem. So that's one possibility. The other one is we have a hierarchy here of I've got a point and then I've got a box and then I've got something else and even though the lowest level one doesn't seem to solve a problem the others depend on it. It's at a lower level. We can break it out into its own unit and we do. So that's an example. So we call that uh, single solution and the last one is flea on an elephant. And flea on an elephant, you can just see it here. If, if I have a huge thing like a logger and I have a tiny little thing like a scoped guard, then I'm no problem putting them in the same component, especially so we can uh, have it be, participate in a usage example. That's a great thing. On the other hand, if it's the other way around, an elephant on a flea, clearly I'm going to be very encumbered if I want to use the flea and there's an elephant being dragged in as well. Think of a flea as an enum. Think of the elephant as something that uses the enum. We'd like the flea in a separate component. So for any of you that see that, that, that enum class that we're looking at, whatever, I have issues, okay? Uh, by the way, don't, don't try to change this. It's an, uh, a flea on an elephant, but it's not a goat on a pig or a dog on a cat or a mouse on a rabbit. None of those. It's, it's got to be really legit uh, flea on an elephant, okay? So, second one, uniform depth of physical aggregation. This is non-uniform. Okay, uh, it's less regular, it's hard to understand. We don't want to see our designs, our macroscopic designs built this way. Uh, what we'd like to do is we'd like to see uh, something that is exactly three levels of aggregation. Um, if I want to use something like this, that fourth one, um, I'm going to break it out into a hierarchy, a physical hierarchy of package groups. Um, is that a question or is that just an arm stretch? Okay, good. All right, so anyway, I just want to make the point that we're limiting our, our levels of aggregation to three, component package and package group, and we're going to talk about that. So here's the first. This is five le levels of physical dependency, but it's only one level of physical aggregation. So this is two levels of physical aggregation. I have things inside other things, components inside packages, and the, the package dependencies are specified explicitly. We don't infer them. The reason for that is we want to be able, as we're designing and building our code, that we don't violate that physical design specification. This is what keeps our code acyclic at the package level. Then, what are the properties? Okay, the, thing, the things that go in it and what they depend on. So any aggregate, no matter what it is, this is what, what you have to specify somehow in metadata and simple metadata. And so here's a hierarchy of packages. Now, this is really useful when you're designing a lot of code. Now, if you're designing a whole lot of code, we go to the third level, package groups. So think of a package as a country, and it consists of cities. But the package is, is an important aggregation and of logical and physical dependency, but the package group is an even more important aggregation. It's a continent where all these different countries are, and everything in the continent shares the same envelope of physical dependencies on other continents, also known as units of release. All right? So how about a fourth level of aggregation? Uh, no, we're going to stick to three, as I said. We're not going to do that, because as soon as you get this level of aggregation, you're talking about something that's too big to manage. So you want to keep your units at a reasonable size for reasonable tools. And this is empirically observed. There's nothing God-given about this. It just is. Um, all right. And then finally, logical physical synergy. All right, so logical physical coherence is one aspect of that. And so here we have an example where a client is using a date, and the person who wrote the date forgot to put the angle-angle uh, output operator. All right, so it's not implemented. person who's writing the calendar needs it. 
they pick it up and uh, unfortunately when when the client decides to to use the output operator they pick up the physical dependency on the calendar which picks up the physical dependency of the calendar on all the other stuff and calendars are much heavier weight objects than dates and this is bad so we don't want to do that what we want to do is we want to implement it in the right place and then the client picks up what they need to pick up and life is good now I realize that in some scenarios we don't pick up everything that, that the, the component or the dotto has. We could pick things up on an individual function basis. But it's not universally true, and there are inefficiencies to that. And so when we are dealing with deployment strategies where you pick up everything in the dotto, this is a good way to do business. It does no harm. It actually is good to reason about. It's modular and so on. So now let's take a look at this scenario. We've got logical physical coherence. I've got a buy side and a sell side. Unfortunately, what we have is we have a component cycle. Uh, excuse me. We have a package cycle. Even though if we looked at just the components, there would be no cycle in the component graph. But we don't allow this because we don't want two libraries to be cyclically dependent. So one thing we could do is uh, we could reorganize this this thing by allowing the uh, uh, the logical entities to stay where they are but just repackage them so that the buy side and the sell side lower half is in one li library and the buy side and the sell side upper half is in another this is not a good idea uh, the trouble here is uh, this is inconsistent with that or that and this is inconsistent with that or that and basically when we look at this it's just a mess we don't want to deal with that kind of thing it gets worse by the way so that's out so what we're going to do is we're going to structure things like this so that now notice that the library the the, the library name and the 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 namespace uh, are are consistent and similarly over here and you can see that the class names have been changed because they're not the same classes the effort that's required to get to this is substantial um, so okay that takes care of that that's the goal um, the last part of this section logical physical name cohesion now this is a big deal this requires you to your mind to bend a little bit uh, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to name things so that when you look at how they're used you can find them without uh, any kind of elaborate tool. You can just know it. This is important. This is actually remarkably important for very large things when people want to try to understand a system. So here we have the classical definition. We've got a package, an acyclic collection of components. All right, here's an example of a bunch of packages. Let's see how we might name things within the package. So we've got this thing called bond price. And uh, it's got a, a component called cost. And at least the component has a .h and a .cpp with the same root name. Thank goodness, all right? Now, you notice that's the package name. This is the uh, component name, that's the class name, and uh, they're all different. So I just want to mention, if something is intended to be visible outside uh, of, of, of the component or, or, or of the unit of release, then it's architecturally significant. And we'd like to keep all architecturally significant things unique throughout the enterprise. That's a goal. So if we look at this, what are we going to do? The, the package name uh, uh, and the component name don't match. Uh, there's the, the, the component name and there's the package name down there. So we're going to come up with this artificial constraint on how we name things. We're going to say the component names begin with the package name. And so all of a sudden, here's an example where we've, we're, we're saying, OK, ABC is a nice prefix, but it doesn't match BTS. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it match. And now we know that BTS underscore cost is in the unit of release corresponding to BTS. And we can tell that by inspection. And that's not a bad thing. Um, and now we want to introduce a namespace. So we say, OK, the namespace is going to match the package name. And lo and behold, uh, what happens? Oh, now I want to um, point out that for people who are not dealing with the open source central version of this hierarchy, you will want to input everything that you write in a higher level namespace that is your own company so that if there ever were uh, an ambiguity, you could disambiguate. But that's just a detail. So now we want to make sure that we can tell from its use where it lives. And so the design rule is uh, the lowercase name of every logical construct declared at package namespace scope okay, begins with the name of the component that implements it. So what does that mean? That means that if you look at bond price, bond price and cost don't match. So let's make them match. Now all of a sudden, if you look at this, 
By inspection, you can tell where this thing is. Now, again, you can say, gee, that looks really ugly. Well, it looks really ugly until you get used to it and you use it all the time to manage your very large scale project. Then it doesn't look that ugly anymore. So I'm just saying, here are all the fights I'm not going to pick because there are a lot of things that you have to do here in order to make this all work perfectly. They're not that onerous. They're actually pretty reasonable. We've been doing them forever. And the one thing that we do strongly suggest, if you follow all of this stuff, you will have no need for using. So if there are people that like to use using, this is not for you. That's okay. But using is, I can't even work on my daughter's projects using using because every once in a while I will bump into some variable that I've never heard of, the thing will stop working and I will have to do a divide and conquer till I get down to a couple of lines and go, oh darn, that's what it is. So please, we can't, it doesn't scale, it's, it's horrible, enough said. All right, so package naming is more than just a convention. Um, suppose I've got this middle layer that's an implementation detail of this collection of, of components. So I'm going to name it one thing, and then the rest of it is client-facing. I'm going to name it something else. You see the problem? See, the client-facing stuff and the stuff that isn't client-facing they can't be in the same package because the client-facing stuff depends on the imp and the imp depends on the client-facing stuff. That's no good. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to do something different. We're going to have to either do something like this or something like this, whatever it is that we might decide to do. But in any event, now we have a group of packages. We call this thing a package group. How are we going to name that? Well, the way we're going to name it is we're going to choose our package names in such a way that they all share something, which is the first three characters. And then all of a sudden the package group is called sub and it has exactly three characters. We don't need to add two more colons to everything in creation. So package groups have three letters. Packages within package groups have four to six letters, ideally four. That way we're keeping the names ridiculously short. So here's an example. We have BL, BDL is the package group. BDLT is the package. Um, that's the component name. That is the class name. And that is the function name. Okay? So I'm just, again, just going through what it looks like. We've got whatever. We've got packages. We've got components. I do want to point out that the test file lives along with the component in the, in the source. So you can find it. That's a big deal. And then we have units of release. We have libraries and we have applications. The library names have to be unique. The application names don't really have to because there's one application per program. So packages or package groups are, are units of release. Um, and the very last thing here is deployment. We might want to put our .h's anywhere. We might want to put them below the architecture level, at the architecture level. We might want to put them all in one place. And so we don't put any kind of path names in our components. They all have unique names. They could all sit next to each other or any subset could sit next to that, could sit together uh, and life would be good. We could package them in a library and in, 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 in an include directory and it's all good. So it's not an afterthought. I just want to point out this whole thing. We have to think about this from the beginning. Uh, it's an integral part of our logical design uh, 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 process or is, in, is it's an integral part of our design process. When we're doing logical design, we're also doing physical design. We're thinking of the consequences. Um, it's something we have to consider long before we start to write code. Um, we have to consider it at the point that we're decomposing problems. So if we're decomposing problems like this, we're wrong. If we're decomposing problems like this or like this, we're right. So when you're decomposing the problem, that's when you think about physical design. Uh, OK, I am eight minutes behind. But that was important. Uh, a lot of you may not have seen this kind of talk, this crazy speed talk before, but the physical design part is incredibly important. So I'm chugging ahead. Um, design and implementation. Okay, here are the five things we have to get through. They're, they're incredibly important and I had to abbreviate them uh, like, like with a scalpel. I mean, it really hurt. So there are going to be some things that you might think are, uh, I understand that. Um, there are two hour, three hour talks on each one of these things that are, that are well, not, not the last one. Um, but there's serious talks that explain the fundamental, subtle parts of it. So please trust me when I say there's a lot more to this. There really is a lot more to this. I'm not kidding. Um, anyway, so common class categories. So this one, not all things are trying to describe a value, but some things are. So we're going to start with value types. 
And there's a lot more to that, I'm telling you right now. We're going to generalize to a small type hierarchy. And it's going to turn out that when we do this, we're going to be able to test things better. We're going to be able to understand designs better. We are going to be much more efficient and have a, a much better shared context. Uh, I, I assume a lot of people would stand Littman's talk today. Um, what we're doing here is we're taking all that C++ offers and we're finding that common good and we're repeating it over and over and over again and trying not to use the not so good or not so common for those places where we really need it and not just because it feels good. All right, so here's an example of a date. Uh, and there's something wrong with this. I have to do this slide. There's something wrong here. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this? Uh, okay, that's a possible answer. But the real answer is that it doesn't have const. Now, why am I not using const? There's only one answer. I don't have room. Okay, but this is, this is a date class, okay? This is another date class. They have different implementations, but they're trying to represent the same value of an, of an abstract mathematical entity known as a date. So the question is, if, if, if year month day of one and year month day of two have the same values, does the date class as a whole represent the same value of the platonic date abstraction? And I would say, yes, it does. These are called the salient attributes of the class. What are salient attributes? They are the documented set of observable named attributes of a type T that must rep respectively have or refer to the same value in order for two instances of T to have or refer to the same value. Now, it turns out, again, there's much more to this story, but, and the attributes don't necessarily have to be values themselves. They could be traits or behaviors. We'll, we'll see about that in another talk. But the idea is, if you look at something like a time class now, there's no trick here. Those are the salient attributes. It's all good. I hope there's some little bit of intuition here. Now, gets harder. Uh, it's an interpretation of object state. It has nothing to do with the representation. So we're comparing a, an interpretation of object state with an interpretation of object state. In fact, it could be a subset of object state. All right? And uh, no other state is relevant. So it has to be object state. And then, what are the salient attributes of a vector? So I'd like to know, what are the salient attributes of a vector? It's important that we agree on this. Size? Okay, so size is one, but what about anything else? The elements, hold it, I like that. So now I get to ask the question, what about capacity? No, I heard a no. It's not salient. Okay, why not? How do we know? What, what God-given law told us the capacity is not salient? Okay, the answer is it's documented somewhere. But once you know the salient attributes, and you know this thing's trying to represent a value, you have a class category and it's a good thing. All right. Uh, now it turns out sometimes we really do want to have, um, uh, uh, well, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Right now what we want to do is we want to look at what does it mean, what, is, what really constitutes the essence of a value semantic type. So if you look at something like a vector, uh, it could be you know that, that I have a vector here and I do a copy construction on it and uh, Hey, does, you know, does the capacity get copied? Now, I assume we know that, that there's nothing in the standard that says whether the capacity gets copied. And since there isn't, we really don't know if memory is allocated for the second guy. We know it, is for the, uh, it isn't for the first guy because that's in the standard. But what about the second one? So we can't know. Make sense? So even if two objects represent the same value as according to their salient attributes, they might not have the same value. Okay? I mean, they might not behave the same way. So what I'm saying is we need a better criteria than just that they behave the same way if they have the same value. So this is the magical uh, uh, definition that I've, I've come up with, and I use it quite a bit. If A and B initially have the same value, for whatever that means to you, for whatever you're trying to do, and at the same operation that's relevant to the abstraction you're trying to model uh, is applied to each object then, there's no exceptions, no undefined behavior, and no overflow, then the two objects will again have the same value. If this property does not hold, your value type is broken, I argue. Think about this. This is a big deal. This is the essential property of value. This is not something you will hear other places. And uh, 
It's really important to know what is and isn't salient. And as I said, there's a lot more to this story. So things you can think about, you know, what's the value of a priority queue? What's the value of an unordered container? What's the value of a regular expression? Think about it. It's, it's non-trivial. It's very important for design. What's the value of a graph? Okay, done with that. Now what about things that don't have value? So here's a flashlight. What's its state? It's off. It's on. Now I ask what's its value? One of the things that annoys me terribly is when you try to assign a value to something that doesn't have a value. Not everything has a value. And it's not clear at all what value you would assign to this thing. So for your intuition, uh, I'm going to argue that these things don't have value. Now if you think they do have value, we can talk about that at the bar. But seriously, these things don't have value either. Uh, my favorite one that doesn't have get value is a scoped guard. It is the quintessential non-value type. Because what does it do? It, it just gets constructed, hangs out, and eventually destroys whatever it was told to destroy. That's its life. So it is, it is not a value type. Okay. It's a mechanism. Those were all mechanisms. All right, so here's an object. If I have an object, it's either stateless or it's stateful. And by stateless, I also include it's not instantiable. So suppose I've got uh, a date util. And the date util is just a namespace. Happens to be a struct. No fight. Uh, it's just a namespace for a bunch of, of, of typical C-style procedures. Um, so here's an example of a date util. And what does a date util do? It operates on dates, kind of the way Arctan operates on a double. It's non-primitive operation on dates. There can be many date utils. As we'll see, there can be only one date, we hope. All right, so utilities are an important class category. We use them all over the place. All right, then we have stateful objects, and they're either mechanisms or they're mechanisms that try to represent a value. We call them value types. The idea being they're both instantiable. We use it casually to say, you know, a mechanism is something that doesn't represent a value. A value type is a mechanism that does. Anyway, so here, here is a kind of a little uh, uh, chart that, that shows you where you might start to think about decomposing your designs into different class categories. And it's part of a much bigger chart. The good news is that those little yellow tags are things you can go look at. They're components that are exemplars of what we mean. And so these are common class categories and they go down into details, but it doesn't matter. As long as you know something is or isn't a value, is, is a utility, or, or it's an abstract interface, as long as you know one of those things, you know about everything you need to know to understand the basics of the design. Okay, so that's class categories. Then we have unique vocabulary types. So interoperability is very important when we're trying to build up these libraries. So it's hugely important. Suppose I have a date class called MyDate, and uh, it has a function in MyDateUtil uh, called F. And then there's your date and your date util. This can happen easily in a company where you have groups that don't talk to each other all that much, even if they do. Then another group comes along and says, gee, I'd like to use those two, two functions as subroutines in my utility. And the question now is, well, what are you going to use for uh, a parameter type? And the trouble is we have an interoperability problem. So now what do we do? Well, there is an answer. The answer is you don't have two date types, you have one date type. And if that's the case, you just use it and life is good. Date is a vocabulary type. It's a type that's used in the interface of functions to communicate either a value or a service. It need not be uh, a value, it can be anything. And we'll look into this. Okay, so not everything should be represented in just one type. There are reasons why we can create our own types. So if you look at, for example, uh, an int versus a date, I can represent a date like this and many people do. Um, I can represent a date like this and many people do. Um, if I plus plus x, I have a bug. If I, uh, if I plus plus y, um, I don't necessarily have a bug. I might have a bug, but I don't necessarily. Okay, so this is good. They're different algebraic structures and it deserves, date deserves to have its own algebraic structure. Now, in contrast to what a lot of people will argue with me at, at the bar, not everything should be its own type. 
And again, there's a tension going on here. If you look at int and string, you know, ages should be ints and uh, uh, strings, uh, file names should be strings because that's their algebraic structure. The structure is indicated by the type and the use or the application is indicated by the, 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 the variable name. It's not the type that indicates the use. For people who believe that, again, we have to talk at the bar. Um, so what I'm saying is here, look at all these things. If I want to call a math function on an integer, that's great. If I've got something else, I've got type shoot size, and I want to call square on it because I want to. I should be able to do that. The problem is if every single thing is its own type, we get an interoperability problem. So we need to be sensible about it. That's what I'm trying to say. There is tension here. Okay? Now, I was waiting to come to C++ now to talk about templates. This is awesome. Because templates have for 10 years given me uh, a problem. Because templates, especially you might know that I have some, some uh, desire to, to have allocators work. Um, templates cause problems when, uh, when the, the, the type uh, changes to something else. That's really the, the bottom line here. And so we're going to look at what different kinds of parameters there are for templates and how they might cause problems. Um, so there are essential parameters that we need. Uh, there are interface policies that we can change the behavior in some way to help us get our jobs done. And then there are implementation policies that we change in some ways perhaps to improve performance or something. They're organizational changes. They're not architectural changes in our in our class or whatever. So essential parameters, uh, they're necessary. What is a vector of, I, I don't know, a vector of, no, a vector of int. We need to know that. So something like this, that's a, an essential parameter. And if I don't know the iterator type, then I'm not going to be able to do that much. Okay, I think everybody's intuition here is going to be good. Um, interface policies, uh, that's an essential parameter, but that is an interface policy. I hope everybody sees the difference. We're changing the behavior so that we can do a different logical function. Then we have these pesky implementation policies. And these guys, um, we've got our essential parameter here. Um, and then we have this implementation policy because it really doesn't affect anything except performance. And this one as well. Now I'm sure I can get some discussion of this at the bar. But let's look at a queue. I'm sure I can get some discussion of this at the bar as well. Imagine we're silly people and we want to deal with locks using a, 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 a policy. So we've got this lock policy here. That's an essential parameter and that's an implementation policy. I hope everybody agrees because the lock really doesn't affect how the queue behaves. Okay? Template parameters affect object type. That is the huge problem. So I've got vector of uh, int and I've got vector of int here and life is good. And then I make it a double and that doesn't compile. How do we feel about that? Okay, he's good. He's good. All right. Now we add an interface policy and all of a sudden I can't compare these two anymore. How do we feel about that? You're unhappy? I'm actually happy because in this case, if I'm comparing something that, that is, is, has a less than a parameter and a more than parameter, and, and, and let's, let's just say, um, the trouble is we don't want that to compile because if I have two empty sets, they won't have the same, they'll have the same null set, and then I add one element to each, they'll again have the same null set, and then I add another element, and now they'll be in reverse order of each other. They certainly won't behave the same way. They don't have the same value by any sense of a sequence that I'm thinking of. So so I'm going to argue that this is also okay. In fact, this is actually good. This is doing us a favor. To subvert this, we would have to have some kind of comparator that behaved differently, but, but still had the same C++ type. So I've got my funky less, and I've configured it to be more, and my funky less that's configured to be less. Then that will actually say they're equal when they're not. And so this is actually okay. But you're just a little early. Now, I add my lock, and I've got this function that takes a regular old Q, and now is this okay? It's a compile error, and it's not good. This is the one that's not good. You with me? Yeah. Okay, good. Everybody see the difference? The other one was just wrong, so it didn't compile. That's good. This one should compile, and it doesn't. Well, it's kind of an well, it is an interface bug, but it's due to the C++ language in some sense. Uh, that's the way vector was written. That's the way all of the standard containers were written. And until we get a better solution, which we have, 
then we're going to continue to make this mistake. So, we can solve it like this. Is that good? I argue that this compiles fine, but this means that we've got to replicate that function in every translation unit, and I'm sorry, that doesn't scale. And I've known this for a decade, and this has given me a lot of lost nights of sleep. So we need to do something better than this. So what are we going to do? And by the way, when I say something like runtime implementation policies in this puke green color, you might think that this is a half-baked idea. This has been around for 20 years, and I've been using it, you know, at Bear Stearns and at Bloomberg, and it works just fine. We can talk about that at the bar. Okay, so here I have a good old object-oriented diagram. I've got a queue that uses lock in its interface. And I've got my lock that implements lock. Lock is an abstract interface. So what's going on here? So I've got lock. It's a pure abstract interface. And uh, it's, got, it's got the uh, destructor, which happens to be not a pure virtual function so that I don't replicate the V tables and all the stuff in every translation unit. We can discuss that. Um, this is a common class category, so just to think. Um, then we have our queue that takes lock in its interface. And uh, notice these, these uh, the, the default constructor and the copy constructor. Whoops, did that a little fast. And uh, they're in blue. The blue things are, 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 are defaulting to zero. Those are extended default and extended copy constructors in the vocabulary that we use when we do the thing that isn't a lock that I don't want to speak about yet. Um, and so. Uh, there's our there's our, our queue, and then we have my lock, and what is my lock? And this is the way we do it in C plus plus O three, and I believe it was Alistair that made me say this, um, but I knew that, but that's not what we have. But anyway, when it's possible, we will do this because that's a good thing. And now we have the use of this nice little library system, and uh, what we've got is we've got a function that takes a queue by pointer, uh, and we have. Uh, a function g and it creates a lock and it passes the address of the lock into the queue making it very clear that the queue could possibly hold on to that address It would be really evil if we didn't do it that way and then here's the queue we call the function and it works even though we configured it with a lock okay now I have to ask this question people are often scared what happens what happens if the lock goes out of scope before the queue? What happens if the lock is destroyed before the queue is destroyed? That's something to worry about, or is it? Is it? Not here, right? The reason is, is that the lock's lifetime is absolutely a superset of the queue's lifetime because of the scoping rules of C++. This is not a problem. Okay, so what's a memory allocator? This is my plug. Memory allocator is a mechanism used to supply memory. It does not have value semantics, even though it does in C++. It doesn't. Uh, it's an orthogonal implementation policy, or should be. Um, it can be and should be a runtime policy, part of our recommendation. And so we're going to talk about polymorphic allocators in some other talk. Um, what is a memory allocator? Well, it should look like a lock or any other abstract mechanism. So this is not particular to allocators. This is particular to uh, implementation policies that have nothing to do with behavior or any of that are simply implementation details that we want to configure. And it happens to work really, really well for allocators. And it maybe works mediocre for locks. I don't know. Okay? All right. By the way, an allocator is a vocabulary type. Um, and so here's an example of a particular kind of allocator. And this is how hard it is to use. And we can discuss how valuable it is to use. But here is my allocator. And when I create my vector, I pass in the address of the allocator. That's all I have to do. And now I can use the, uh, the uh, vector the same way I use any other vector. And when it's done, it will go away. And this can be as much as four times faster than normal allocation. Because a buffered sequential allocator just so happens to take its memory from the, from the stack, if, you, if that's what you want to do. And the cost of allocating memory on the stack is essentially zero. And the cost of getting rid of it is also essentially zero. So you don't wind up paying for much. Again, that's a, that's a longer discussion, but we can discuss the benchmarks. This is something we use all over our front end. And I've, I've won over a lot of people. For people I've talked to that, that have done similar things and it hasn't worked, um, we should talk more at the bar. 
Okay, here's uh, Pablo Halpern's paper on polymorphic allocators 3525, definitely worth a read. Uh, it, it went over well in, uh, in the UK and we're gonna keep going. We've been working on it since 2005. And we're making good progress. All right, you can also see in our open source distribution BSLMA allocator because that is the polymorphic base class for our distribution until we get this thing standardized. Okay, uh, designed by contract. Um, Everybody probably knows this, so I'm going to go over it really quickly. Uh, this is a function. That's its interface. These are types used in its interface. That's a contract. We'll get back to this. Um, here's a class. Here's its interface, the public interface. And here's part of its contract. And here's more contract. Okay? I know it's frustrating when you see words on the screen, but trust me, I'm just trying to give you a, a picture. Okay, now I've got a component. It's got the public interface for the class that's in it and then it's got the free operators. And so that's the interface. Everything that's public, ex publicly accessible from the component is the interface of the component. And of course it has some more contract. And by the way, um, this is an example of how we write contracts and lots more to say about it, but there's an example. All right, so I'm gonna go on. Uh, preconditions and postconditions. I assume everybody knows what that's all about. So here's, here's an example of a function, and this is what? A precondition or a postcondition? Precondition, pre good. It's a precondition. And then uh, for functions, it's just the restriction on syntactically legal input. And then here we have uh, what? Okay, so that's a post condition. Good. And for stateless functions, it's what it returns. And it can return it in various ways. But in this case, that's what it returns. All right. Now if I have an object method, what is the precondition? It's the thing that I have to satisfy, including the state of the object. So for example, what are the preconditions on something like pop, pop back? Size is greater than zero. So that's certainly possible. Uh, and then the post conditions are what's supposed to happen. Okay, also known as essential behavior, and Kevlin Henney pointed out that post conditions are, are or I should say essential behavior is a, uh, a superset of post conditions because post conditions are static properties and essential behavior includes is it thread safe, what is the runtime complexity, and so on. So we have now, we have undefined behavior and essential behavior, and then there's this stuff in the middle, which is neither undefined or essential. Okay, so this stuff in the middle is a dangerous area because we're, neither, we're not promising what will happen. It won't blow up, but it'll do what it'll do. So if you look at this contract uh, and format the object to the specified output stream uh, at the absolute value of the optionally specified indentation level and return a reference to stream. If level is specified, optionally specify spaces per level, the number of spaces per indentation level for this and all of its nested objects. If a level is negative, specify the indentation level uh, on the, uh, oh, suppresses the indentation level on the first line. If spaces per level is negative, uh, format the entire output on the line, suppressing all but the indentation level is governed by level. Uh, uh, initial indentation is governed by level. And then if stream is not valid on entry, this operation has no effect. So here's a long paragraph of stuff. And it tells you a lot of interesting information. And now the question is, is there any undefined behavior here? And it turns out, mm, no, there isn't. But there might be some non-essential uh, non behavior. In other words, this doesn't tell you absolutely everything and how it will behave if you satisfy its preconditions. So just, just so you know the difference, now we have an interesting question, and this is a bone of contention worth picking. This is a fight that I have to pick. Here I have uh, a, well, I'm gonna pick it shortly. I'm a little ahead of myself. Here I have a contract. Is there any undefined behavior in this, um, in this uh, function? I'll give you a hint. Any undefined behavior? The answer is yes, there's undefined behavior. You have to put in the right, uh, a valid year, month, and day. And that's by design. And now how about this one? Is there any undefined behavior in the copy constructor? It doesn't say there is. And one of the things about our methodology is we tell you if there are preconditions. We just come out and tell you. It's not a secret, we tell you. So, 
Now, there's another thing here. Object invariants. Here's an invariant of the date class. Uh, we're saying that the date class uh, maintains a valid date in this range. We're saying that. Whether it's good or not is another bar discussion. But the question is, does the code itself have to preserve invariants even if one or more of the pre preconditions uh, of a method's contract is violated? I.e., suppose I pass in some bad stuff to, the, to the, uh, the constructor that takes year, month, and day as ins. Do I have to make sure that this does not get uh, a bad date value and, and corrupt the program? Yes. Okay, so we have people that say yes. That's going to be an interesting discussion. Because according to our beliefs, the answer is no. If you say yes, then you're, you're implying something to all people. Because if anybody in this room disagreed with you, then they would be unhappy that we did it. And if, So I can't satisfy everybody, as we'll see. Or actually, I can. But I have to do it in a slightly different way. It is not a local contract guarantee that if you provide undefined behavior, that the behavior is un, undefined. I mean, that if you do something that is undefined behavior, you can't count on what will happen having done the undefined behavior, because that's a contradiction. So what happens when behavior is undefined is undefined gives us some flexibility that we will take advantage of. And for anybody who cares about high-performance computing, clearly you can't do that. You're, just, you're giving away machine cycles. We'll talk about that. So design by contract says, if you give me a valid input, I will behave as advertised. Otherwise, all bets are off. These are the things we think about when we're dealing with um, uh, um, uh, contracts. So we say what it does, what it returns, essential behavior, we've talked about that, undefined behavior, i.e. post conditions and preconditions. We have a little section that clarifies things, non-normative notes. We always document every function in this order, not necessarily as separate sentences. So I just want to point that out. When we go to verify things, preconditions, okay, you have to read the manual. That's how you tell whether you satisfy the preconditions. It's not going to tell you necessarily that you didn't. But it turns out there are ways to do it. Now this assert thing here is a way of, of ending the program. There are better ways. And we presented one uh, at, in the UK a few weeks ago and it went over pretty well. So there's another option coming. But if you don't want to wait for that, there's BSLS assert, you can look at that now. Um, post conditions. How do we make sure that if somebody gives us uh, a, a valid input that we produce the right thing? And the answer is component level test drivers. We have to make sure of that. And test drivers are the right way, not assertions. And then finally, invariants. How do we make sure that invariants aren't violated? And it turns out the only way we really know how to do that is to assert in the destructor. And so that's what we do. We assert that the invariants are valid as an object goes out of scope, because that's the one place we know every object is going before it goes out of scope. You take that and in concert with a test driver, and you're in pretty good shape. All right, so appropriately narrow contracts. This follows from design by contract, we'll see. Um, what, is, what is defensive programming? Um, anybody have a thought? You check the condition, all right. I'm going to generalize and say redundant code that provides runtime checks to detect and report but not handle or hide de defects in software. Is that going to work for you? Okay. Um, is it good or bad? Yes. Okay, good. Both. It adds overhead, but it can ident uh, help identify defects early in the development process. Uh, which is better, defensive programming or designed by contract? Yes. Do you ride the bus to school or do you take your lunch? Okay, so... Good. So what are we defending against? Uh, bugs that w in the software that we use uh, uh, in our implementation, that meaning like, suppose we're using Boost. Are we defending against bugs in Boost? No. Okay, how about bugs we introduce ourselves because we suck at programming? <laughs> how about misuse by our clients? I'll give you a hint. That's what it is. So we want to defend against misuse by our clients. And in order to do that, we need narrow contracts. So here's an example of string length, which happens to maybe argue to be a narrow contract, or maybe it should be wide. What should happen on this call? Okay, how about return zero? 
These are the, the people that answer these questions when I, before I even get there, die hard. We're going to have to talk at the bar. How about, how about it returns zero? Well, the trouble is then I have this code stuck in there. And what's the worst thing about this code? The worst thing is it's likely to mask a defect. The other worst thing about it is it's more code. It's going to run slower. Even if you don't execute code, code that's there gets sucked in and run. So the more code you have to suck in, the slower it's going to be. It's just a fact of life. So we don't do this. Uh, we say it's undefined behavior. By the way, so does C. It's undefined behavior. So this is a narrow contract. It asserts this, but if it goes away, no problem, just don't pass in zero. Now you're probably still not happy. How about this one, set date, int, int, int. Should that return a status? Absolutely not. Why? Because if it does, uh, then anything I put in is valid. Now I know my birthday is March 8th, 1959, so I put it in clear as a bell. Unfortunately, I had to put it in like that. But since I knew that was my birthday, I didn't check the status. There's no build mode that can help me. Oops. So this is a double fault. We don't like double faults. Double faults are really hard to defend against. If it were either one, uh, I forgot the status, or excuse me, if I put in a bad thing, then all I need to do is build it in a different mode that checks, and then I am back to being safe again. But in this situation, absolutely not. So we have to be careful, what are we really trying to do that works, and works for everybody. So returning in status implies a white contract because there's no undefined behavior. But, oh well. So white contracts prevent defending against these kinds of bugs. Now, here's an example um, where I can assert is valid on this thing. Now if I assert is valid, I can take that out. By the way, the is valid function is much more expensive than the function that it's trying to protect. So if you put this into set date, for any reasonable implementation of date, there would be a problem. This one happens to be deliberately designed to illustrate a point, but it's still expensive. So we don't want to do this. We did the benchmarking. Uh, even Howard Hennett did it. He said that his, his checked date was eight times more expensive than ours uh, overall. It, it, I think that speaks volumes. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to have this nice additional function called set date if valid. And that, and that function, uh, we are interested in the result. But if you don't check the status on a set date if valid, you deserve what you get. So we have both. But we don't call one when we don't need it. That allows us to do the check. All right. So what should happen with this wonderful behavior? Um, suppose I call operator bracket uh, outside of the valid range. Call it with some strange number. Well, we have another function called at. And this happens to be my least favorite function in C++. And the reason is very simple. There's nothing I can do to take the uh, uh, inefficiency out of it. It's there for life. So I'd much rather have one that I can configure once I know my program is working. So, but then there's this problem that that thing could crash. But it turns out, no, we have a better answer for that. And we'll get to that. So preconditions always imply postconditions. Whenever your function cannot do what you want it to do, uh, it cannot return normally. That's a requirement. So it's, um, if, if it can do what it's supposed to do, abort is a valid option. That's a possibility. Um, good library components are exception agnostic via RAII. Uh, when I say exception agnostic, in our world, we don't try, we don't catch, we don't throw, but we are exception safe. So if you want to inject an exception, knock yourself out, but we're going to handle it with RAII, and we'll run equally well in an exception and non-exception build, and life is good. And we'll probably be more efficient as, as a result. Okay. Uh, now, narrow contracts allow undefined behavior to come in. I said that, I said that having Having undefined behavior possible is actually a good thing. And why is it? If you don't have to deal with it, you don't have to write the code, develop it, test it, document it. Um, less code runs faster, um, and um, it allows us to extend the functionality in a, in a stable way if we figure out what it really should do. Um, but really, it enables practical, effective defensive programming. And finally, defensive programming means fault intolerance. So if you thought defensive programming was fault tolerance, definitely maybe bar fight, I don't know. But this is important. I hope you remember defensive programming is fault intolerance. Okay. So 
overriding customer focus, I had to say this. One thing we do that most people don't do, we come up with real usage examples before we write the components. Once, once we have that down, then we go and implement them um, for a real world purpose, not just because we figured out, oh, this is cool. I'm going to go build this thing. Then I'm going to send a paper into the standards committee and hope it gets accepted. No, please. There has to be a reason, a real reason for it. And once we've got that, uh, we want to document it in a way that's consumable by all of our people, uh, our customers, and then we want to validate it in our test drivers. We make a big deal out of this. This is easy to understand. And here's an example of a usage example, and it's a picture. I don't expect you to read it. It's on the slides. I mean, you can look at this online. The idea is the stuff that's in the yellow, when we do our, our extraction and display, comes out as code blocks, and we have a standard phraseology that allows you to walk the usage example. So I'm, again, I'm giving an example here. I'm sorry I don't have time to do this. This is a picture. Okay? Forgive me. Canonical organization. Um, uh, the, 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 what I want to do is I, I want to have a uniform set of categories that we partition our information into in our components and packages and package groups. So we have that. Then there's a certain order that we present it. So we have that. Uh, and then there's a certain vocabulary and phrasing. So we have that. Uh, and especially in contracts. So this is another thing that's being kind to our, our, our users. We go out of our way to do this. The only way to do that, there has to be a bottleneck. And that's me. So I tell everybody how to phrase things and what to do. And so it's all the same. And even if it's not perfect, it's better than if it's all different. And everybody gets to suggest things. And this gets better and better and better over time. So this is easy to find and use. And then lastly, consistent useful rendering. Um, we want to make it look like the code was written by one person. So unambiguous standard function names. I can't stand clear and entry. I don't know if I'm the only one. Remove all and is empty in a way that it's just human language just makes things better. A consistent argument order, like outputs, inputs, and parameters always. Um, and appropriate use of pointers and reference to indicate intent directly from the source code. This is another huge um, religious war that people have. Um, I really do believe that for large projects, this wins. Again, this is my experience. Um, we'll talk about this. So helpful visual cues. Because I'll tell you, C++ is hard. And as soon as you lose those cues, I'm lost. I really am. All right. Um, verification and testing. Uh, ensure, OK, so ensuring our, our own reliability while improving that of our clients. What are we going to do? Component level testing. So in a nutshell, we want to test in isolation. Uh, we don't want to let it get away from us. Because as soon as our test driver is too far away from what we're trying to test, we can't sensitize a path back to our test driver to figure out whether we got it right or, or not. And if we change anything in the middle, we're in trouble. And so this is what people do sometimes. They test from the, uh, the, the, the GUI or whatever. So this is bad. Um, we're not going to do that. This is my oldest slide, this and the next one. We want to test hierarchically in a tree-like way where we test the first level, the second level, the third level. And at every single point as we're testing, we're testing the functionality added at that point. We're not trying to test the stuff below. Hugely important. Ah, OK. This is so ridiculously an overview that to say that it just, this is, this is itself, this slide is a book. So what we're going to do is we have to understand what it means to test. And that means coming up with two different ways of representing behavior. Then we need to find test data that will expose any differences in that behavior. That's test data selection methods. Then we have to have a way to deliver that data to our uh, a component under test to make sure that we observe any differences. And finally, we have to order our test cases in such a way, it's called bootstrapping, that allows us to leverage functionality in the component in order to test less primitive functionality in the component. I'm really sorry I don't have more time to talk about that. That's just a book. All right, so the component level test driver, what is it? Um, well, it's that. Okay, it's that third thing that's used to test uh, our component. Um, it's a tool for developers. It's also a cartridge for an automated test system. Um, what is a BDE component level test driver? Look at BDE stands for Bloomberg Development Environment. Basically, in a nutshell, it's a bunch of test cases with assert statements. Um, 
good enough. What's the user experience? Should operate quietly when it doesn't have a problem. If there's a problem, it should tell you where and what went wrong. Um, there should be different modes so that you can do some sort of trace. The most important one being you want to make sure that when your test driver runs in, in a, a very verbose mode that every loop in the test driver is entered. It's awful when a test driver runs and says it's all good and tested nothing. So we don't allow that. That's a test driver. Notice how regular it is. It's awesome. Okay. We have a test plan in every test driver that tells you in what case if a function has been fully tested. Again, this is just you know obvious stuff. Each test case has a little section, it's kind of like a little subroutine, and it points out the concerns, very important. You need to know what it is you're trying to test. Uh, if you don't know what you're trying to test, you're in trouble. You gotta have some fault model. So you list out the things you're concerned about, and then you do something reasonable to test it. And the way you do that is you write a bunch of assertion statements, and this is only a brute force approach. There's loop-based, array-based, table-driven, there's all kinds of stuff that we could talk about, we're not going to. But that's the key interface here. Every test driver defines the notion of assert. And it's kind of like a regular assert, except that it doesn't end the program, it just accumulates the number of errors. Okay, so that's how we do component-level testing, that was really brief. Um, peer review, well, one thing about peer review is it's complementary to testing, as we'll see. We want want to make sure that the documentation code and tests are clear, correct, and effective. So having someone else do this is synergistic with testing. In other words, um, they do overlap to some degree, but they're really strong as a combination. Okay, the third one, static analysis tools. Um, things like Clang, oh my goodness. Clang, they provide additional consistency uh, that can be, or uh, checks that can be used by our clients as well as us. And because of our consistent structure, they're way more effective than if you don't have a consistent structure. So Clang-based tools are awesome. Defensive programming precondition checks. This is the answer to everybody who said, oh, this guy's a nut. He wants to have undefined behavior. So as library developers, how much CPU time should we spend detecting misuse? Does anybody have an answer for that? I heard less than 5%. Did anybody have another vote? How about 5 to 20 percent? Anybody want more? How about 20 to a constant factor? Like we just won't run in anything but debug mode. We do that by the way. We have parts of our code base that we don't run optimized because we, we're going to wait for that thing to core dump and then we're going to figure it out. And then sky's the limit. Order of magnitude, whatever. So people will want different levels here. I think we can all agree that we, we're not all the same people and uh, we have to accept that. So I can't hard code in the library the answer to the question. Can't do it. So now as library developers, what should happen if we detect misuse? We're writing library software, we detect misuse for whatever reason, including that our client told us to. We could be fired because we shouldn't be detecting that stuff because that's a problem. If you didn't detect it, we wouldn't know about it, we wouldn't have to fix it. The other thing is we could ignore it and proceed on. But that's pretty bad too. Or we could just return immediately. Oh, he wanted me to look at column minus one. No problem. Just return or, or add one to one. Just forget it. So that's no good either. We could terminate the program, but that's the old style, right? That's an assert. Uh, we could throw an exception. That's another possibility. We could spin waiting for, uh, to break into a debugger. That's another possibility. We could do something else. So what we basically have is any number of things we could do, right? But what should we do? And the problem is, I don't know, um, how should we as an enter enterprise decide what we should do? Well, it depends. How mature is the software? Are we alpha, beta, or production? Is this performance critical application? Uh, is there something sensible to do? So if we want to, for example, save our, our client data and then exit, that's not unreasonable. All right, who should decide? Number one, how much time to spend in an application, uh, checking for bugs in the, you know, the misuse of the library. Who should decide that? And the other one is what happens if the preconditions are violated? Somebody has to decide this. One possibility is uh, the, the reusable library developer. How would they know? They have no context. The other possibility is the poor slob that caused the bug in the first place. The guy who called the component directly, the immediate client. Certainly not. 
The third one is the owner of the application who, number one, is responsible for building it. So he has control over the build system. And two, owns main. Guess which one? So every application developer gets to choose both of these things. And that's a cool thing. So if you want to read about this, BSLS Assert will teach you how to use this and have your personal exact way, every one of you. Awesome, right? Okay, so you've got these controls. This is handled at compile time. That's handled at runtime. Knock yourselves out. By the way, this is itself a two-hour talk, for real, which I gave at ACCU in, I can't remember, it was 2011 or 2012. I think it was 11. All right, so now we're on to this last thing. I have five minutes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get to a point where I can stop. Anybody that wants to walk out can, and then I'll probably be another seven minutes. So I'm going to certain. I'm going to see what I can do to get at least some stopping point here. Um, this is what the BSL package looks like. Um, it's a vertical column. As it turns out, uh, even though we try to make these nice directed acyclic graphs, it just turns out that when you all is said and done, it's pretty darn vertical. And so we're just going to look at these 11 packages, 10 high in levels, and two of them are not our standard BDE stuff because we're trying to adapt to the C++ standard, which in no way, shape, or form is our standard BDE stuff, but we still love it. Okay, so here we have BSLS. It's the BSL package, it's the BSLS, uh, excuse me, the BSL package group, and the BSLS package at the bottom. And so these are system utilities. Um, they provide support for, for testing and the BSLS assert macros that we just talked about. So that's at the lowest level. And here's just a list. Again, this is a picture. I don't expect you to read that. You can go look at the slides or you can better yet go look at the stuff that we have online. Um, here's BSLMA. What does the MA stand for? Memory allocators. Okay, so we have the protocol. This is the quintessential vocabulary type, protocol being an abstract interface, pure abstract interface. Um, uh, it's, uh, we, have, we have some guards uh, that we use, excuse me, this is the, the implementation of the uh, allocator that, that uses new and delete. We also have a test allocator. We also have a uh, place where you can go to get the current default allocator. So you should read about this. Um, yeah, I said the test allocator. And a bunch of guards and proctors. Proctor being a guard that you can release to allow you to do RAII if this is how you choose to do it. There are other ways to do it, but these are there. And they work if you're not the most advanced programmer. If you are, well, then there are other ways to do it, which we happen to use. Anyway, um, Okay, so that's that one. And this is just to show you, if you look at this picture, I've color-coded it, and from this picture of BSLMA, you can see I have a common class categories. The most common one here is mechanism. I have one value type, that's in blue, one metaprogramming type, that's in red, deliberately, and, uh, and I have one abstract interface in yellow. Now, if you get used to these colors, and by the way, they, they we're trying to stick with the spectrum. So we're going from like the deep blues, you know, through the green, then the yellow, then the pink, and then the deep red. We're trying to follow this so that it makes sense in terms of the kinds of classes that the components are implementing. I'm showing, I'm showing you that just kind of for fun. Um, and then we have BSLSTL, which implements a bunch of our own implementations of containers. Uh, we have the short string optimization. We have, um, we have node-based containers that have their own adaptive queue of pools in them, which work way faster than other implementations. So I'm, I'm sort of bragging about that a little bit. And they also, um, uh, all of these are allocator aware, polymorphic allocator aware, and they also work with other standard facilities, so they're compatible with other things that don't want to use polymorphic allocators, which is kind of interesting. Okay, anyway, and then there are other, other uh, the other non-allocator based facilities are just passed through to your underlying um, uh, the library vendor's implementation. Um, and yeah, this is the, the other things on top of it basically adapt to allow to use it in a standard way. So, um, how do you find what you need? Well, it turns out that we use Doxygen, but we use a very stylized markup language, and uh, we have an organized uh, home page, so you can go take a look at this, browse through it, do whatever you want, all good. What licenses apply? MIT, because we want everybody to have a party and do legitimate things and, and use it any way you want, including making money. Um, so this is the tentative stopping point 
where if you don't want to sit through another seven minutes, you don't have to. I'm okay with that. Um, but this is where you can go look at the stuff. All of this stuff up till now was leading to the next part, though. So if you walk out now, you're going to miss the, the good stuff. I'm just saying. We'll come back to this. I will go fast. This is, there's only 100 slides left, I swear. 150. But it turns out it's animation. That's deliberate. Um, so anyway, what else, what else do we have here? We have, beyond BSL, we have BDL. And we're going to start releasing more and more software. And we're going to talk about a couple of allocators very briefly. So here are the two allocators, the buffered sequential allocator. And you have a question. Have you um, benchmarked any of these allocators? Oh my god, yes. Any, against anything like TC Malik, uh, well, Google, which is Google? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about this for a couple of minutes. That's it. So first thing is yes, and let me explain where it works. These allocators are not your typical allocator. You're probably used to an allocator that isn't an arena allocator. That's just, we just plug something in, we use it ubiquitously. That's not the case. I was referring specifically to another arena allocator, which, which is... Another arena. The, okay, I, I, I think I, I know what you're saying. Um, we're gonna, this is a, a, a deep dive. Let me talk about that afterwards. But let me go through this and tell you where we use them. There are two very different allocators here. One of them is designed to work in a single-threaded application where you're taking uh, a memory from a buffer initially, and then if it overflows, you go to a sequence of, of, of increasing uh, uh, queue sizes. So in other words, you might allocate 1,000 bytes on the stack let's say, and if it overflows, you'll go to 2,000 and 4,000 and 8,000 off of the heap. That's what buffered sequential allocator is. It's incredibly good for building up a data structure, using it, and getting it out. If I had a vector of vector of strings, and I wanted to build it up, use it, and blow it away, you can't beat that. That's my answer. You can't beat it. It's like Dynaray on steroids. Because it is Dynaray, because you're taking the, 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 the buffer right off the stack, you're using it, and if it happens to overflow, you're going to other stuff. Dynaray doesn't take an allocator, think that's a bug. Um, anyway, um, BSLMA uh, um, multipool is completely the opposite. Suppose you have something that gives and takes and gives and takes and gives and takes memory all the time. Well, it's already probably a bug because it's a node-based thing that doesn't have a pool built into it, an adaptive pool. So that's a problem. But in any event, not everything is perfect. If it takes an allocator, you can plug that thing in. So those are the two possibilities. Now, I wasn't sure when I originally wrote these slides if I would have time to do a diagram for each of those. So this is a buffered sequential allocator. I want you to think about it like bovine buffered. It's, this is it. But this is the real picture. And uh, what it is, is it's a buffer probably on the program stack, which overflows into an increasing sequence of, 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 of geometric growth for, for uh, uh, blocks of memory uh, off the program stack. So that's what it is. The sequential allocator part is, is the, that part, but the buffered one is saying, I want the first allocation to be ridiculously fast. I want the rest to just be crazy fast. Okay, so this is it. This, by the way, people at my company love this thing. Really. Now, um, note that, by the way, if you delete something from this, it's a no-op, because we're going to get rid of all the memory at once. This is a managed allocator. Managed allocators are, are, are things where you can blow the whole thing away. You don't even have to delete stuff. Uh, you can just, goodbye. All right, so now this is the multi-pool allocator. Again, we're dealing with farm animals. Um, this one took me a while to draw, but the idea here is you have an entire sequence of pools that are, that are adaptive. So let's say in the case of uh, uh, the 24 one, we needed only three things. The first time we allocate one, this, or, or excuse me, we needed only three blocks. The first time we allocate one, enough for one object, then two, then four. Now it saturates at 32, because once you've allocated 32 nodes, there isn't much benefit to allocating 64 and then 128 like there was in the other one. Uh, I'll actually describe this in, in my 1996 book. But this is also good stuff. When you're in an arena, when you're in a place where you need only a few object sizes and you're going to need to give them back and take them and give them back and take them, whatever. This is a multi-pool allocator. We have a corresponding multi-pool that you can use without going through the virtual overhead if you're building a data structure, which is probably what you should have done, but then you would know the sizes and then you would have gotten it right in the first place. So this is, you know, again, we have to understand. All right, these are for the oversized. If you have to, for something too big, you just get it as a sequence of blocks. So it's a little bit of overhead if this is not what you're doing. Okay? Um, now, this is sort of the, the crescendo here. Suppose somebody comes along and says, write me a date class that tells me whether today is a business day. Um, okay, so you get a date, and it seems it, like it needs to do everything, and pretty soon you're depending on the world, and this date is unusable by any human being. 
I mean, it does what it says it does, but really, it's, it's just not good. So I'm saying bad things about it while I'm talking, and you get the idea. What are the real requirements here? There are three of them. Represented date, represent date values of C++ type. Determine what date value today is. Determine if the date value is a business day. And by the way, provide a hierarchy of, of reusable components while you're doing it, because we never want to do this again ever or anything like it. So represented date values of C++ type. Now you look at this and you go, what the heck is he talking about? There's a mechanism, oh it's green, yes. And oh there's an enumeration, it's a kind of value type. Okay, a date, oh I know that's a value type. There you go, you're done. Now you say, all right, I've, I've satisfied the first requirement. Now I'm going to determine what date uh, value today is. Well, let's put this aside, and then let's look at these other pieces that, that individually make sense, and together we'll answer that question. We have the system time utility. Okay, that's a util. Uh, we have an unconstrained value semantic type in time interval, so it's blue, and we've got some other blue things, and it turns out we know blue is a value semantic type, so here's our diagram. We have a lot of stuff. We know what kinds of things they are. Uh, uh, there's our second answer. Then we go to our third one, determine if a date value is a business day. So we'll put that aside, then we'll create some more machinery, and that's a protocol, so it's got that nice yellow color. And uh, day of week set, and that's a value semantic type. And a packed calendar, and that's a value semantic type. Why? Because a packed calendar represents uh, a collection of date values over some interval, and it just is. Okay, and then we have a calendar, it's also a value semantic type, but it's faster because it keeps a bit, uh, uh, um, a bit vector in there so that it can look things up way quick. And there you go. And then, wait a minute, there's a problem here. Where's the data source? We didn't tie this thing to a data source. Did we do that on purpose? Absolutely. So where is the data source? Well, it turns out that the data source is somewhere over there in our client domain. So we're going to have this calendar cache, which is a mechanism that holds on to calendars that have been fetched from the, from the data source. And we have this protocol, which is a calendar loader, that our client can implement and then install the calendar cache. And oh, let's just look over here and see what's going on. Yeah, there's a mechanism that implements the calendar loader. And now we're back here and we're done. See how easy that is? Once you have all this stuff, it's really easy to do this. You might think, this is crazy. How could I ever do it? The point is, the first time you do it, it sucks. The second time you do it, it's amazing. So if you do this for a living, and you always do this, pretty soon, I'm telling you, all right. So finally, the fourth one is, well, while we were doing this, what did we forget? Well, there are a lot of interesting things you can do on a date, so we're going to create a date util. We're going to think of those things that other people needed that you didn't ask for. And there are a lot of things you can do if you have a calendar and a date, so we've got that there, and again, what are these? They're utils. Notice that the utils all have the same color. When you look at this diagram, if it didn't have color coding, I mean, even though it does, it's probably a little daunting, but that it has color coding makes a big difference. So there's your answer to that problem. So now we go back to components because those were classes and we say, okay, here's BSL, here's BDE, this is our world, and here you see BDET. So BDE is a package group and BDET is a component, uh, excuse me, uh, is a package, and uh, this is the BDET time interval, okay? And uh, here's BSLS platform, and so you see BSL is the package group, BSLS is the package, and now we have the client phasing stuff and now what we're going to do is we're going to fill out all the parts that we didn't need in the architecture. So we didn't need this, but we're going to break it down into parts that we are going to use over and over. And BSLS assert is something we use almost everywhere. So now you look, uh, look, I have these level numbers. That pick, that little diag, that little line there, we don't need it. It doesn't change the level numbers. So we can take it out and it won't change anything. So it's gone. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to go through and fill in the pieces. And so these are all parts that people don't really see. And, of course, and then we're going to take our calendar. We're going to need a, a bit array that's not a vector of bool because we need some sort of efficiency. Um, and you can see that bit arrays are built out of bit strings utils, which are bit out of, built out of bit utils, which in turn are built out of this. So this is the, the back end of what we're doing. I showed you this because just because you have the components that the client needs doesn't mean you're done. You have to drill down so that it looks like this. Well, it doesn't really look like this because we already drilled down below this. It looks a little more like this. But actually, even this is a lie. It really looks like this. And this is just the stuff that we use to do this. This isn't all of it. This is just the stuff that we used from previous things that we've built. And the red guys, by the way, are metaprograms. Just want you to know that's there in red. But they're way down low. Okay, so this is our hierarchy. 
And we have all these different uh, package groups. Uh, and we got through this, and so there needs to be a conclusion. Fortunately, it's blissfully short. Um, what are we trying to do? We were trying to make things faster, better, cheaper. But we're trying to make them faster, better, cheaper all at the same time. And by moving, by having stuff already done, we're not only make, giving you more options, but we're moving it off the axis because it's already done, so you don't have to write as much code. The code that's already written is, is higher quality, uniformly higher quality, mind you, and writing less stuff is cheaper than writing it anew. And uh, the idea is if you're old style and you do this, you know, over time, yeah, you know, productivity goes down due to cost of ownership. If you were to cleave off some aspect of your company and start writing software capital, pretty soon you get the crossover point and you never look back. So. The final conclusion, we've exhibited a proven methodology that yields hierarchical reusable libraries. It does, we use it, it's 10 years into it, and it's not 10 years that I've been doing it, but it's 10 years at Bloomberg, more than that. And uh, we're open sourcing it so you can give it a try and help us be successful. This is the final slide, and thanks for staying a little bit late, I apologize. That was 854 slides. All right. Anybody that wants to leave is welcome to leave. No problem. If anybody wants to come up and talk, that's fine. You have a question? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I have a question for you. Sure. You mentioned a couple of things like uh, you know parameter ordering and the physical structure and cyclical dependencies. Do you have any experience with like tools which will automatically check it or evaluate? Absolutely. We we write them. We'll be writing them. We'll be writing more. If you look. If you were to look in my 1996 book, the Appendix C is a tool to do dependency analysis. But yes, they exist, they're good. Yes, sir? Um, I would not recommend having never done it, and because of the way we write code, it isn't a problem we need to solve. We don't, we don't have an issue. We, when you include a header, if you look, I mean, if you look at anything that we do, there's a component that, does whatever it needs to do. I don't need a precompiled header because I don't expose all of my headers to everybody. Do you see what I'm saying? The answer is I. But I. But yeah, I can't comment. I. I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. I haven't used them. All right. There are no other questions. I'm here all week, so you can come up and bug me.